why are we doing this? What's the point of doing this? Why are any of you here today? To, are you here because your boss sent you? Are you here because maybe you believe in the future because you got kids and you'd like the fact that when your kids get older or your grandkids get older, then, you know, you'd like them to live in a country where there's actually jobs and prospects to do something? You know, I don't have kids. I don't have a company paying me to do this. I'm doing it, and I think a lot of you are doing it. This is the right thing to do. It really is the right thing to do. You guys, it's not too often that somebody can say, the job I do is gonna make a difference for generations and generations. A little bit more about why? Well, we're in a tough spot in the United States. We've got energy dependence on foreign countries. We've got huge deficits. The jobs of the future are, are going away, and Jim Kennedy is gonna talk a lot more about, about why the jobs of the future, the so-called jobs of the future are going away. And 10 million lost manufacturing jobs. And so you can ask yourself, why as a nation are we pursuing solar and wind so vigorously? Well, everyone's from Stephen, on, Stephen Chu on down knows damn well that solar and wind are just nothing but jobs creators. They know that it's not going to hurt the bottom line of our friends that uh, sell natural gas. You know, what's your best guess? 3%, 5% maybe take over? But it probably will generate a couple million jobs because, you know, when the windmills overheat and burst into flames, somebody's got to go put it out and then put up a new one. You know, and when all the turtles in the desert die from the solar cells, someone's got to pick up the carcasses and clean the little window glass. So it's going to create a lot of jobs. So what's our solution there? Our solution is an old solution and not a paper reactor, you know, Hyperion, Empower, uh, anything else that's out there, God love them, but they don't exist, you know. New Scale has a test facility plant, you know, with uh, heating elements to simulate heat. That's great, super good for them. Fact is, none of them work. The MSR worked. Our particular version of the molten salt reactor is the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, okay? It gets rid of coal. Coal is the number one enemy for society. You know, from China, United States, the billions and billions of pounds of coal we burn are going to kill us. It's proliferation resistant. I would like to say it's proliferation proof. Essentially, no one is practically going to ever target a molten salt reactor uh, for, uh, for any kind of terrorist threat. Uh, thorium is everywhere. Something like uh, 2 to 4% of Miami Beach and the beaches in Brazil are thorium oxide. You don't have to mine hundreds of thousands of pounds of ore and create all sorts of mess like you do when you're uh, uh, mining uranium and concentrating uranium and making yellow cake and centrifuging it down. The thorium oxide is ready to go right out of the bucket. You bring it out. The other thing is you get thorium when you get rare earths. What do we need? We need rare earths for our magnets, for our integrated circuits, for all the things we call the jobs of the future. When you mine rare earths, you get thorium. So the stuff that's going to run our future and the energy to run our future. Rare earths, thorium, they love each other. You always find them together. Molten salt reactor runs, we were just talking about the heat. The MSRE that ran for uh, 14,000 hours back in the 60s ran at an average temperature of 700 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, it eats actinides, it's, uh, it's a compact design, it is the original SMR. Molten salt reactors are small modular reactors. I'm a proponent for doing this stuff where it was invented. We invented this, the United States of America, we paid a lot of money for this, it was a fantastic uh, uh, technology. Who's going to build the small modular uh, reactors of the future? You know, if not the United States, and who? Well, India, you know, the, the usual suspects, India, Japan, Norway, Russia, Brazil, Canada. But uh, if uh, China is making these, you know, we've already got a country that is, you know, really handing it over to us. And, and you know, they've got cheap materials, cheap labor, uh, and they already have cheap energy in the form of coal, except it's cheap, filthy energy. So if they take away cheap, filthy energy and replace it with cheap, highly abundant, very, very clean energy, well, the hockey stick of innovation will go fairly straight up and the United States is going to be mired. So this is an existential problem that we must solve. Going back to the NRC discussion this morning, we, we don't have 5, 10, 20, 30 years to approve fuel cycles, to approve small modular reactors. It's, it's an existential problem. When Admiral Rickover said, I want a light water civilian reactor, the, the nascent Atomic Energy Commission said, okay, well, think about it. All right, Admiral Rickover, if we really work hard, we should be able to get you one by 1982. <laughs> and you know Admiral Rickover had, uh, Admiral Rickover had sh sh uh, shipping port running within seven years. And just as a little side note, shipping port ran on thorium. Okay, so if you don't think it ever worked before, shipping port had an outer jacket of thorium <coughs> as its last fuel. So we know how to run solid fuel reactors on thorium, and we know how to run liquid fuel reactors on thorium. We've got online refueling, and because of that, we can also do isotope production. And all of you obviously know, because you're in the business, what a dire, dire, desperate need we're in for medical and industrial isotopes. This uh, particular MSR is designed to do isotope refueling, or online refueling and isotope takeoff. 
because of the high heat, we can use the Brayton cycle. The Brayton cycle uh, is a much, much more efficient turbine, not only in the fact that it's literally more efficient and that it captures a much more, uh, uh, much more of your heat and energy, it's also much more compact. A steam generator, we'd be lucky to fit it in this room. Uh, a, a Brayton cycle generator would maybe be a little bit bigger than this podium. And they have the same power output. So an incredible uh, uh, amount of work done at the Idaho National Lab, again in the United States, paid for through tax dollars that we should be putting to use in this country. And it's not something that should take five or ten years to approve. It's something that's sitting on the floor of INL right now. The MSR runs at atmosphere. We don't have a 3,000 PSI pressure vessel. It's not a pressurized system. You don't need 10 foot thick concrete walls. You don't need three foot thick giant forged vessels to hold everything together. You don't need special super uh, uh, certified welders to make sure all the flanges are together and not cracking. This is, a, this is an atmosphere system. The other thing about it is that the sodium is solid at room temperature. So if this thing ever did somehow get beyond 800 degrees C, if it ever overheated, so, so to speak, we have freeze plugs. And when the freeze plugs overheat and melt, drains down into the containment tanks. So it can't overheat, it can't overpressure. It's a self-regulating system. It's a load follower. Uh, what they found out about the fireball in the airplane is the more they pushed it, the more fuel it pulled in. They, they throttled back, pushed the fluid back out. It was like the radiator on your car with an overflow tank. Commercial version of the uh, MSR, commercial version of the lifter, probably about $2 million per megawatt. Uh, three modest sizes, 10 megawatts, 50 megawatts, 200 megawatts. And how would we make them? Of course, you all know how we make any of these small modular reactors. Uh, we make them in a factory. Just the way we make these very complex airplanes, we can make complex reactors in a factory too. And these things are all highly, highly regulated things. I hear these airplanes take a long time to certify, but once we make one, we don't have to re-license every other one. So maybe you all ought to get on the horn and start telling the NRC that they should come up with a licensing scheme that says once we get one working, we don't have to re-license every other one down the road. It's not just for power, you can do water. This particular thing would be worth developing just for the fact that it's an actinite burner. And so who's gonna put a stop to all this? Well, you also know this too. You know, the people who don't want this, MSRs don't really replace liquid fuels like oil or, or gasoline or anything like that. What do they replace? They replace coal and natural gas. You know, our little friend down there in the lower left-hand corner, yeah, he wants, he wants windmills with his natural gas. Of course he does, you know, because he knows both one, he owns a lot of, and the windmills are inefficient and gives him a nice green shawl to hide behind. That middle picture shows you the distressingly common result of building a lot of windmills. Uh, that's, a, that's a windmill that blew up in Holland. And, uh, and what else are we gonna do? Peaker plants like this? What people don't understand is that peaker plants are just about the most polluting plant there is. The reason they get away with it is because they're a peaker plant. They only run for maybe seven or eight hours a day, tops, during the middle of summer, and they're allowed to average their pollution out over the entire month. So it looks like they're super clean, but the fact is while they're running, they're even filthier than a decently run coal plant. So they're funding the fight against us. Uh, I just was able to testify at the Blue Ribbon Commission, and we testified just after a couple of, of folks that were, you know, saying that we shouldn't have a future nuclear policy whatsoever. Our future nuclear policy should be to decommission the fleet. And I guess, you know, wear flower sacks and, uh, you know, dance around <coughs> in circles, but uh, uh, that's not gonna happen. So what's gonna happen is all of us in the room are going to work towards the goal of small modular reactors. And if you want to join me, I think small modular reactors equal molten salt reactors. And if you need to know anything more about it, please go to the Thorium Energy Alliance. We have hundreds of documents and lots of videos. And I want to tell you whether you're into thorium or uranium, light water, pressurized, molten salt reactors, you guys are the future of energy and you're really going to make a difference in the future. So I want to thank you for the time and effort you took to come here today and work together towards such a good goal. So thank you. Give yourself a